you and I have kept a secret for 20, 24 years now <laughs> of our first moonshot that we did together. And and I want to tell a the world literal about moonshot. A literal moonshot. <laughs> and I want to tell the world about this. And I want to see if your remembrance of it is the same as mine. So um, I think the story begins with you first on where the idea came from. So why don't you tell that part of the story? Well, ever since seeing humans land on the moon, I was fascinated with that. It had a big impact on my life. It made many people inspired about How math and science. How old were you in, on 1969? I was 11 years old. Okay, and I was nine, so yeah. eight, nine, yeah. And my brother was eight. Yeah. And Larry and I really, really dreamed of going into space, but of getting back to the moon, of owning something from space, anything related to space. And I remember actually when eBay launched, I was really excited to go find a moon rock. And I started looking to search if there was a moon rock available, but you can't own a moon rock. But I, we found out there was an auction where you could buy a patch, a patch of someone who had landed on the moon who had some moon dust in it. <laughs> and that was so exciting to even have anything that had been to the moon and back. Did you buy it? I, I did get that. <laughs> Do you remember and, how much it cost uh, you back then? I don't, don't remember. It was, it was at an auction at Sotheby's in New York, and Larry went there for me. And it was really, really incredible. But the idea of getting back to the moon was so exciting and we're right in the backyard of JPL and the internet was taking off and the idea of having sponsors and advertising and allowing people to control with a joystick, the educational possibilities of getting a new generation of kids excited about the moon was too compelling to not follow through on. So just to set the timing here, this is 1999. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the peak of the dot-com insanity. <laughs> and, and the idea of doing something mechanical when everything else was internet only was yeah. very, very enticing. And I'm a mechanical engineer from Caltech, and my brother from Caltech as well really thought we could do something like that. And then meeting you, we really thought, we can pull this off. So my end of the story now is I got a call from your brother, Larry, and I remember exactly where I was. And it's like, you know, hi, Peter, uh, Larry Gross here. Um, my brother and I want to recruit you to be CEO of one of our companies. Now, I had not heard of Idealab at that point. I'd heard oh, of the wow. Idealab companies, but you know, some quick searching uh, got me like, okay, 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 what? Really? <laughs> so the call said, we want to do a private mission to the moon. I remember flying out to meet Larry in person, meet you, meet Marsha. And my memory of that was pulling up to the front here, what, 130 West Union Street, pulling up to the front door uh, in December 1999. And I remember seeing Porsches and Lamborghinis and Mercedes double parked too, too wide, right? It's like literally, it was like cars, like these expensive cars all up and down the street. And I remember walking in the front door and everyone was running. <laughs> Everyone was running. We had a whirl of activity. It was such high energy, right? At this dot com, like just pinnacle. It was like running, running, running. We were at the center. Oh my God, you were at the center. I mean, at that point, uh, you know, name some of the companies that you had oh, we, going we on. We had Cars Direct. We had eToys.com. Go to. We had GoTo that went public. We had City Search that went public. We had merged with Ticketmaster. We were just, it was really crazy times. It, really, really exciting. But it was like, People couldn't walk to the restroom. You had to run there to, to save those microseconds and go work on your business. And, and so we sat down. I was running the XPRIZE Foundation and Zero G at the time. I remember that. Uh, XPRIZE in 1999, we had not raised the 10 million yet. And Zero G had not flown its missions yet. We were going through our STC process. They would both uh, happen you know, about four years later. And... You made me a job offer. Now, I had never had a job before. <laughs> you know, I was always, as an entrepreneur, doing my own things. But it was like, how, can you, how do you turn down? And so I remember you said, listen, we have a fully funded mission to the moon. Because you had just raised a billion dollars in cash, which was a lot of money back then. I mean, we throw a billion dollars around like it's nothing today. And I think you had said, okay, we're going to allocate $60 million to do a private moon mission. And I remember your pitch to me was, we're going to do this privately. We're going to land on the moon and we're going to send back the signal 
and people are going to pay for advertising and pay for rights and we'll carry stuff and sponsorship. We'll do this like a sporting event, going to the moon. Is that yeah. what you remember? Yeah, and you were going to get National Geographic to cover it. Yeah. We're going to do a making of video. We're going to follow it, all the technology. We really wanted to make an educational experience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you and I had both been so impacted, and Larry, impacted by the lunar mission. I went home. I don't know if you know this. I sold. I was living in Rockville, Maryland. I sold my I house in one day. I did not know that. That's I sold incredible. my house in one day. I literally took the first bid, <laughs> packed it up, and <laughs> moved to Pasadena. Wow. And, uh, and then it was, on, we were on a mission to like build the team that could privately go to the moon. Now, people have to remember this. This is before SpaceX, before Blue Origin, before any of these companies were around. And the idea, let alone of, of building rockets, um, but the idea of building a lunar lander and going there. And we ended up um, hiring some of the best talent out of JPL. Like you said, just down the block over here, uh, Tony Spear, who had run uh, the Sojourner mission that landed on the moon. Right, that little yeah. cute little robot. You put together an amazing team. Yeah. You really put together an amazing team. We they, had, they were so talented. They were. We had beautiful designs. And I remember one day you said to me, Peter, um, uh, I want to introduce you to somebody who's going to be a great director of photography. Do you remember who that was? <laughs> <laughs> Un unbelievable. Jim, Jim Cameron yeah. shows up and... Uh, oh, he he had so many ideas uh, for how to make I, it better. He not only was he director of photography, he had storytelling ideas. Yeah. He said instead of just one lunar lander, you need to have two little children that move yes. near the mommy yeah, the and have a third-person perspective. He, he, right, and, and and he really, really, he really was, drove up our mass budget, yes, our budget in de de general, de definitely. <laughs> but I mean, it's incredible to have Jim Cameron, you know, br in brainstorming sessions with us of what kind of cameras we're going to use and what the positioning was and what we had to do on the moon. And I mean. Uh, we, we didn't even have HD cameras at that time, but he had just invented one. Yeah. So, some of the first AC footage was going to come back from the moon because the early pictures from the moon were very grainy, except for the photographs they took, but the actual live footage was poor. So we were going to solve that. And I remember we decided to keep it under wraps. We wanted to keep it a secret for whatever reasons. I guess we wanted to have a, a big you know debut moment. And so uh, we didn't tell anybody. We didn't announce the company. Um I, in, in retrospect, I think we may have had some people out there really come to us if, they, if we had known it. But uh, the next thing we had to do was we had to buy, you know, we weren't building rockets. We were building the landers. So we had to go buy rockets. So the first rocket we bought was a, I uh, remember from Orbital Science, that I was in the rocket business back then. Uh, we bought a, a, uh, a Taurus, um, then the size of our of our lander grew, and then we bought, bought a, a Taurus XL, and then the size of our lander grew. We bought a, an Athena two launch vehicle, which was in storage, which doubled the mass, and then our payload grew again. And then Larry and I were in Russia shopping, shopping for uh, rockets. This is a couple of, like a year or two before Elon went to Russia shopping, and we bought a Dnieper, which is an old ICBM that could like launch all the mass we could possibly want to the lunar surface. It was crazy. Ah, uh, and really, then, really incredible. and then, well, along the way, I remember, okay, you said, Peter, uh, we'll fund this, but I'm putting the first 12 million. And at this point, you know, you'd raised a billion of capital, but you're shepherding the money. Um, I think you were in, back then in the goal of taking Idea Lab public and you had to buy back public shares. And, and so you said, okay, here's 12 million to start with. And let's go out and raise some money. So we're out on the road together. And we had a lot of people this close. Yeah, we People did. were we very interested. Spielberg involved. Yeah, yeah we had a lot I of mean, people. Having James Cameron and Steven Spielberg on a private mission to the moon. I mean, it doesn't get cooler than that. I, I remember going outside and looking up at the full moon. It had a completely different meaning. Crazy. Um, yeah. Crazy. So it's really a shame it didn't work out, but it was really, really an incredible effort. Well, really the incredible. reason it worked out was the dot-com crash. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, April... Of 2001 hits, and you know, <laughs> you're you're trying to raise money for what? <laughs> uh, but I I think we would have had a good shot. Yeah, 
And it's hard, as as you as we've seen since then. Yeah, it's amazing. No one has done it since then. Yeah, you know, on the heels of the the company called Blastoff, a great it, name by the way. We had Blastoff.com. Yeah, Blastoff.com. Yeah, and, and I, I like to say Blastoff splash down. <laughs> uh, my biggest achievement at the end was not bankrupting the company, but and placing the employees. I was so proud of, of placing our employees and putting the assets aside, uh, and and then. I remember one day, this is, this is April, we have a all hands meeting, you know, you just saw the NASDAQ crash and we've got to, we've got to put the company to moth, mothballs. I get a call from you and Larry and you say, Peter, it was, I remember it was on my birthday, it was May 20th. Wow. And uh, you said, there's someone you have to meet. And I don't know if you remember this, but I was in a different, we're in a deal at, uh, uh, conference yeah, you, room here you, you're down there. Yeah. and the other one over there and in walks Adeo Resi and Elon Musk and Elon had just sold PayPal uh, e e oh, what you call it? Uh, yeah PayPal to eBay and we're trying to pitch him on getting involved in in this yeah incredible well there's a great story about this that relates to the bigger story of entrepreneurship and what you started the conversation with there's many ways to make the world a better place you can do it by being a teacher and teach people. You can be a preacher. You can be a lawyer. You can change rules and laws to make the world different. But you can be an entrepreneur. It's a really incredible way. As an entrepreneur, you can make your product that gets pulled as opposed to pushing it on mm. people. And it's, a, it's only one of the ways to make the world a better place, but it's a very powerful way. And because we had set this company up as an entrepreneurial venture, we were able to take some people who were working sort of hourly, by the book, getting their job done, and unlock human potential by bringing them to a company where they felt like they're in control. They have equity. They have a say in what we do. The team you put together was amazing. It was an and, audacious and, and, mission. And it was, it was audacious. And, and when you get people behind an audacious mission, you can get people to do things that never would have been possible before. And that's what I love about entrepreneurship in yeah. general. You know, one of, the, one of the lessons I learned and one of the challenges we solved um, that I would have never thought it. You, I don't know if you remember what the most difficult part of our mission I, was. I don't, I don't. It was getting the bandwidth back oh, yeah. to the earth. For, for, the and, for the image quality we wanted. For, and also then getting it distributed. So I remember going and meeting with Akamai. Remember Akamai back then? Yeah. And our largest budget item on this mission was what, first of all, we had to use the deep space network to get the imagery back from the moon. We hadn't negotiated that yet, but once it came back down to JPL or Goddard or wherever it hit the earth, to distribute it to millions of people back in 1999, 2000. Yeah, well, this is before broadband, this is before- Way before. Before fiber was everywhere. It was, it was, the budget for distribution was bigger than our launch budget. Wow. And so we came up with another company, which is what one does here at Idealab, was called Desktop TV. It was peer-to-peer -peer, uh, I remember networking. that, yeah. 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 It was, well, so, uh, so many times you have to invent things to make things work, but also sometimes you have to wait for those things to be invented and at scale to help you make it. Yeah. And that, that comes back to timing, which is well, relevant for so many things. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about yeah, that yeah. In, a, in a moment, one of your brilliant insights. Uh, yeah, I'll just say for folks listening, the, it frustrated me so much that this mission didn't occur because it was all of us invested so much of our time and reputation and, and energy. And it was just a beloved mission. It's like you would work on it for free, right? It was like a, it was a holy calling, right? That, that's how people feel when they're working at SpaceX or Blue Origin or XPRIZE and others. We, and I remember after the Ansari XPRIZE got won in 2004, I was up at the Googleplex, Larry... Uh, was on our board and Sergey was a, a benefactor. We're that was him. such a huge accomplishment. Yeah, it was fun. I, I remember the celebrations around that and just seeing the joy on people's faces when that was yeah. accomplished. When someone didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> really, really incredible. Uh, and, and so Sergey said uh, to me, what do you want to do as the next X Prize?" And I told him about Blastoff and I said, I want to do a, a lunar X Prize, a lunar, you know, uh, landing. And so we took what we were planning to do with Blastoff and turned it into an XPRIZE. Google put up $30 million and it ran for 10 years. They extended it twice and no one had achieved it and they shut it down. But four alumni, three have gone to the moon um, and had an energetic landing, let's just say it that way. Unplanned. It, unplanned. <laughs> <laughs> Disassembly. Uh, is, is, Israeli team went there first. Uh, then we had a Japanese team and the U.S. team. 
Uh, there's another U.S. team going shortly. Um, and Sort of it, proving how hard it is. It is. It's hard. It's hard. Well, I remember you said the one of the most expensive things was the bandwidth. I remember the things when the engineers were talking. It was great to listen to those great JPL engineers discuss the details they had to do. You have to worry about thermal expansion from the front to the back or the thing that's in the shade. The part that's in the shade is so cold yeah. and the part that's in the sun is so hot. Like every little detail you have to worry about when you're in space that you don't have to worry about on Earth. Really, really incredible engineering challenge. I want to show you a video that you haven't seen yet and it's the sizzle reel from uh, from Blastoff. This was done by Bob Weiss. Bob was, oh. uh, was my... COO, uh, he came out of Hollywood. He was a film producer, done the Blues Brothers. Um, anyway, uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide and let's play this video. Bob did some of my favorite movies of all time yeah. too, some of my favorite comedies. Here. I really didn't know he had made this. What if we told you that for the past year, an amazing team of scientists and engineers has been plotting a rendezvous with history. What if we told you that this team wants you to be part of their mission? And what if we told you that this was all part of a secret government program to go back to the moon for the first time in 30 years? <laughs> We'd be lying. We're not the government. So we are going to the moon. <laughs> Look how old the CGI is. That's incredible. A company called Blastoff. Wow. Blastoff.com. That's incredible. Uh, it was, what a what a joyful uh, couple of years that was. Amazing team and um, almost.